Victoria and I could not separate. We couldn't be alone against the much larger threat outside, than the risk of the two of us post chrysalis together. I was drifting off. I was exhausted. Victoria was my last memory of that last moment of consciousness. She was fixated, furrow-browed, into the night through a break in the window. Then a spark of intense interest in her eyes as they squinted with an assassin's scrutiny. A literal millisecond observation before I passed out from wretched fatigue. I awoke to myself, broadcasting a piercing scream. The pain was stronger than ever. I was losing my mind, engulfed in bone-snapping, skin-splitting agony. I was also losing a grip on reality and quickly diving into a blur of new thoughts that were I recognized as mine, but not mine. The hair sprouting up was something that I was used to and caused no real pain. I always identified the pain as isolated within muscle and bone. My nails dropped off, covered in blood. Thick pointed nails shot out through the skin, creating an agonizing addition to the overall pain of what I couldn't see, which was the muscles being torn apart and replaced with steely sinew across cracking bones, stretching limbs outward from my torso that was also stretching into a long, barrel-chested mass. My eyes became a portico of highly acute panoramic night vision, bringing fragmented objects into view. The pain in my head caused me to close my eyes tightly to gather up some restraint and respite from the cellular destruction, but not much. I could see clearly now. I was still on the ground where I vaguely remember being before I slept. I was remembering. I had a grayish recollection of who I was, but it was incredibly fleeting. I only remember being razor honed to purpose. I felt angry, malevolent, and focused on feeding. I feared nothing. I perched myself up onto crouched, long, clawed feet and surveyed. I was alone. I somehow remember not being alone before this. A woman. I was with a woman. She was a friend. I remember she was a friend. Where is she? I smelled others, but could not determine the source. Definitely lycanthropic peers. I could think. I don't remember the other experiences in this form, but something tells me that this was a first. The sentience of it all now. My ears were rotating sonars, attempting to pick out sounds that were vital amongst the ambience of the forest. I walked into the night from the door that was open. Was it open before? Seems that it shouldn't be. I saw no movements outside, smelled much but nothing distinguishable, and the sounds were everywhere. Then, hearing a howl far away to my left, I knew that this was a familiar. It sent a message that I deciphered as, as friend. To my right, though, another, much deeper howl, not familiar, not friend as far as I could tell. Unknown. I took a few steps forward to gain a better perspective, emitting involuntary grunts and snorts. Somehow, the howl to my right began to feel familiar. I couldn't mitigate this in my mind. I couldn't resolve the feeling of familiarity. I did, however, know the sounds of footsteps and the scent was getting closer from both sides. I crouched again, into the tall, lifeless, grassy meadow. I listened and sniffed my perimeter intensely. The sound from my left stopped in the distance. Although the presence was in my nose, it felt as if the pause was strategic. The right, however, this mystery, still advanced towards me in very slow steps. I was starving and I had no time for games. I needed to eat, and in this form, it gave me the best advantage for finding and killing prey that would keep me 
sated for a longer period. Despite the horrific nature of the meal acquisition, I just smelled no prey anywhere. This place was dead, and this was worrying. I kept a sharp gaze upon the tree line to my right, then only identifiable with my canine vision, appeared two glowing yellow eyes in the dark, just inside the forest, cloaked in black. It emitted some visible breath into the cool night, and a low, deep growl. I perched on my haunches and returned a low growl. I was visible in the moonlight, waist high up, but this visitor was, like me, clearly and enveloped in the blackness of the forest. I heard a step forward and then a howl, like it was in pain. The eyes faded away. The beast thrashed around inside the tree line, and the sound of branches snapping and trees being collided with made a confusing, havoc-filled din throughout. Then, the familiar howl behind me, from what I recognized somehow, as Victoria. The new stranger, however, that had approached was being attacked, I believed. It was in pain and rattling about in a ruckus. Because of the slight recognition of this being, I wanted to help, but there was this notion that I would be endangering myself, and that occurred to me. I decided to make a move. I had to help. I was thinking without fear, just intuition. My intuition prodded me to assist this wailing creature. I moved with intent, but as quietly as possible. I knew that the sound could be a matter of critical seconds if this beast was being besieged, but needed a survey of the scene first. As I approached the tree line, my eyes adjusted to observe the brush within the forest entrance and the disarray of sticks and broken things flying about. This was not an attack, at least not by a second assailant. This was metamorphosis. This was a creature like myself, Painly returning to his human form. The wailing and squeals of agony were in sync with fur flying, bones cracking, and sinew stretching. I've never seen this happen from my own eyes to another, not even Victoria, during our cage nights. I was not in view of her, and certainly not up close. This man was now a man. He laid naked, covered in mud and dead leaves and small branches, eyes closed, fatigued. I would know for certain. I was starving, and this man would be easy dining. Especially in this tired state, there would be no struggle. In its previous form, probably no chance, but now I could feast at long last. But I couldn't. I knew this man, face covered with debris, but as his eyes slowly opened, I knew this face. Andre. This was my old friend. Even though grotesque, monstrous filters, I knew this was my friend, not foe, not a meal. I concentrated to think. I tried to gain my faculties again. To think like my human self. I tried to file through memories and emotions. From this focused attempt, I was struck by an acute stinging pain that ran across my back and legs, and then my head exploded with pain. My focus had triggered my change. I was changing. At will. At least that's how it felt. I buckled in pain. My last memory from this form was Andre's eyes widening in shock. And then I swear. He then smiled. I tossed and turned. And all thoughts vanished until I awoke and opened my eyes. Sitting with his back against a tree was... Andre covering parts of himself with a bunch of mud-soaked leaves. He smiled again. Hello, <laughs> Yankee Doodle. Long time no see. Andre exhaled. I forced a relieved smile through the pain. I crawled over to him, grunting through aches. And for the first time in my life, I was one of two naked men hugging. I told him to come back to the cabin. At least it was some cover. We would just wait for Victoria and we could get back to the car as quickly as possible. 
We had enough food and provisions for the three of us that included Peter, rest his soul. But we would take Andre back. I don't care if he protested. He would come. He must come. We sat back with blankets and exchanged some long overdue words. Andre, I, s I saw you walk away drunk from my apartment. I told you to stay. If you just listened to me, we would not be sitting here right now, cold, hungry, and cursed. I lambasted him. Andre looked away. I know, my friend. I was drunk. I remember nothing except fast attack on me in darkness. It was quick. Then remember waking in woods like this with others like me. Older, some same, some kids. They, we, patrol these woods. Sometimes must go to village for food. No prey in woods, forest dead. Cheeky and pig horses sometime. Some of our group want to eat men. Andre exclaimed. I was shocked. I thought all of those poor people missing. Some found gutted. This was the work of the bad among Andre's group. Andre... You must have convinced them this is not the way. At least in a saner form. You talked to them. You convinced them. I asked. Ah, we cast them out. Banish them as they not stop killing. This not our way. Even you. I know this was not our feeling. Our purpose. Then they swear at us. Fight with us. One killed in the fight with older pack leader. Others chased away and threatened they find Churovisco to curse and we be sorry for casting them out. He added. It immediately dawned on me. They did, Andre. They did succeed in turning some Chudos to cursed beasts. They killed my friend. I knew they were hybrid ghouls of the cursed DNA. They were strong. But my friend was somehow stronger. She killed them. She is Victoria. We wait for her now. We will leave together. You will come with us. We will go back to her home near the border. It's safe there. We have food and security and cages, if necessary. If we must be separated in the night, you must... Come with us, I pleaded. Alex, I have friends here. We are support each other. I cannot leave them here. He replied with consideration. I must let them know. He finally added. Andre, we don't have time for them just for you to say your goodbyes. We have to leave immediately when Victoria returns. We need to leave at first light. We have a long drive ahead. We need to eat and be rid of this damn place. We came for you. Now we found you. Please, just go. They'll understand, Andre. I had made my case. Okay, but I go. But I must return to them. They are in danger without me. He added. Okay, fine. But for now, we need to leave this place. Victoria will be here soon. We must try to find a way to cure me, and if we can do, we can do the same for you. If you know who cursed you, who poisoned you with this, then we cure you also. If it works at all. It's promised to work by some of the healers we spoke to, but we need the blood of your maker. I insisted. This not possible now. Anna, our leader, she killed one who made me. The one who made me want to kill more humans for food. Ivan. He was killed by Anna when they were cast out. Then tried to kill us during sleep. Anna stopped them. They ran, but my maker was killed. Ivan and his group kill one of young when attack at night. Anna went crazy. Kill him. Want to kill rest of group, but they got away. They were Maxim, Boris, and Anastasia. Savage and dangerous they were. He explained. I am 
afraid for village. They now more dangerous without Anna to hold back. Victoria, Andre, and I made our way out of the arboreal nightmare into the space where we had left the car. I drove back while the other two rested. I was fatigued. This didn't materialize as planned. I had lost my friend, Peter. Victoria's sadness could not be mitigated. She did not speak the entire journey back, and Andre, sensing this, did his best to provide light levity to move the subject, but didn't penetrate Victoria's fortified ramparts of bereavement. We stopped a few times for food. We ate inside while Victoria stayed in the car, half sleeping, half dazed with swollen, teared-up eyes. Bringing food out to her, despite her lack of appetite, we continued pushing forward to the now-widowed home of Victoria. We were determined to rest up for as long as it took, and then attempt the supernatural process, of which we knew nothing more than myth-based rhetoric from a now-deceased shaman. Deceased, courtesy of Victoria, no less. We arrived to the now-quiet cabin of Victoria and the late Peter, and immediately dropped into slumber, awaking only in the late morning of the following day to foggy windows that cut out most of the light and sparse ducks and geese chatter from the nearby lake. Victoria had not given up on caring for her guests, regardless of the situation and trauma. She was tough as nails. I don't think I would be consolable, let alone as active as she was. She had prepared a large breakfast with some potatoes she had pulled earlier from the garden some eggs put aside in the pantry. Victoria and Peter typically left their food outside and not often refrigerated. The food was rarely processed, and the old ways didn't call for refrigeration in such a usually cold climate. There were no real threats, and a sealed crate was enough. Back home in Canada, it would have been hung from a tree. Then again, the bear, wolf, and wildcat population was thriving in Canada. I entered the kitchen to see Victoria setting the table, and I offered a sullen smile as our eyes met. Eggs scrambled, bacon fried, and I have fresh bread for you if you would like to have with your meal. She offered to me in an unusually boisterous tone like a, a woman attempting to do a thousand things at once and not having time for the answer. Ah, oh, yes. Thank you, Victoria. That would be nice. May I help you? I replied. Please wake up your friend if he wants to eat today. She hastily replied while walking into the pantry. Back turned to me. Ah, yes. Let me check on him. I'll see if he's hungry. I said. Victoria turned to focus on me without any hint of emotion. He eats now or he does not eat at all. He can walk eight kilometers into the village if he wants to find food. Victoria sputtered in a harsh tone. Drawing a long breath, eyes closed, she placed her hands out and in front of her, palms down in a meditation pose, lowering them with her slow, exhaled breath. I'm sorry. Didn't mean to raise my voice to you. Please, just bring him to the kitchen. I formed a forgiving, warm half-smile, moved to the creaking basement stairs. Descending, I called out to Andre whispering at first, then yelling out with a slightly raised voice. I didn't remember seeing him on the other side of the dark basement when he woke and ascended to the kitchen, driven by the smell of Victoria's fry-up. Also subconsciously, I wanted Andre to have a long rest after what he'd been through. He would have been sleeping in a forest for weeks, and they would need him fully recuperated for the experiment to come. After all, he was the key. Or so the myth goes to the lifting of my curse. We really had no idea if it would work. The myth had evolved over hundreds of years. The curse was born into the Red Forest, a product of the Baba Yaga. They have lived for centuries, and over time the remedy was explained in hundreds of ways by hundreds of so-called experts and crackpots. It was made clear by one such expert or crackpot that I must receive a transfusion from Andre, and this would allow me to revert to normal. As Andre was the giver of curses in this particular scenario, inflicting this like and obscenity onto me, I hoped this would work. We didn't explain this expectation of Andre to him directly. 
It was simply assumed that he would want the best for me. I reached the bottom of the stairs and I looked into Andre's cozy, dark corner, behind the bars of his personal cage. A bundle of blankets rose to form a mound on the mattress. I knew that Andre was tired, but would half expect him to stir by now with the din of my shouting. I attempted to open the cage by lifting the outer latch, but it seemed that we had been too tired to lock him in. Luckily, we were all too fatigued to have caused incident. I then gave a low call to Andre again as I stepped inside. Andre! You mudak piece of shit! Wake up, man! Let's go! I swear I'll eat your breakfast along with my own if you don't get your ass... I stopped and suddenly became aware that I was speaking to no one. I kicked the pile of blankets and started spreading them out onto an empty mattress with my foot while I tried to contemplate the fact that Andre was gone. He was gone. He wasn't upstairs. He wasn't downstairs. I turned to run upstairs to check outside. I noticed a note tucked into the bars of his cage. Alex, I make danger for you and lady. I go. Anna and Pac will look for me. They will find me even here. They are many. I not make danger. They take much time, but they will find me in end, and they kill as they look for me. Innocent people. I go and ask for forgiving. I tell them not to make trouble for you and lady, but please, you go far. Please, be safe. Thank you for saving. The note was clear. Even by Andre's standards, they will kill him. I whispered to myself, and more selfishly, I thought that I really needed him. We lost Peter forever because of our search for Andre. I understood his brave attempt at trying to steer them away, but now I have no hope of removing the curse. Andre will die, and if that wasn't enough, I just remember the recent events of discovery of the mutant werewolf, the hybrids of the radioactive mutants, and the legendary cursed lichens that were bizarre to behold and even more frightening to consider the existence of. I rushed upstairs to notify Victoria, squeezing the note into her fist. How far had he gotten? When would he have left? Victoria, upon hearing the news, swung at the timber wall next to her and with a crash punched through the wood with power that I had no idea that she possessed. She was enraged. She had just lost her husband, the love of her life and partner, through times unimaginable by anyone else. All just to rescue Andre. She was livid. Her eyes changed into deep, burnt, yellowish rust as she screamed an almighty, piercing shriek. It was all for nothing. This quest, the mission had been fruitless. She fell to her knees and sobbed. Not for the loss of Andre. On the contrary, at the hopelessness that she found herself in without Peter, it all came crashing down on her. The loss, the capture of Andre, stemmed the grief because the mission was achieved in honor of Peter. Now it seemed vacuous an effort, and a life violently ripped from her for the selfishness of Andre. The irony of this did not dawn on either of us, that he left to spare their lives. Victoria would have been happy to have gone up against all of them for vengeance, alone. In fact, she counted on that encounter. It was decided there was no other option than to go after him. Somehow. We had no idea where he could be at that point. We only knew that we had to try. We had to bring him back, make him understand that he had to help. If only we had explained to him what we needed from the start. We could have made him stay long enough to extract his blood. However, between the moment of Andre's discovery and the fleeing for their lives, there was little time. If we lose Andre, it was over for me. I could never go home. I could never live a normal life again. Stupid, stupid Andre. 
What was he thinking? Victoria and I decided that we had a better chance finding him where we did the last time, rather than exploring the vast woods between here and there at this moment, especially when we had no clue when he had left. He could be near the main road with a five-hour head start, or in the bush with a one-hour head start. We'd be chasing our tails and decided that a big breakfast was what we needed before our final journey to end this. I ended up eating his breakfast after all. We packed up what we needed, including a lot of firepower. Victoria had no stake in this. She wanted revenge, but had no idea what that thing was that took her husband. It was a mutant variation of ancient wolves and those radioactive beasts. This thing, these things, should have never come to be. But there was no doubt that these things were born of an already impossibly ancient DNA, integrated with a radioactive mutation. A horrific design. It wasn't emotionally behind her, but it could not be a priority at the moment. She was doing this for me. We secured the house, got on the road and made our way to the Red Forest. We stopped a few times along the way for food and other things, and eventually approached our parking. Soon, within a few hours, this could most certainly be our last glimpse of sunlight. We equipped ourselves with our hiking needs, and of course, weapons. Two handguns, one hunting rifle, knives, and a taser that Victoria had acquired from a Minsk survival shop. We treaded carefully, our senses on high alert. It was mid-afternoon, had a few more hours of sun remaining. We sniffed the air, better than most. A collage of scent wafting through the forest breeze, but mostly carcasses, moss, and mud. We hear no birds, no frogs, nothing. The air was cold. The canopy above created a gloomy landscape, robbing us of what little sunlight existed in this hellish part of the world. We had some, but what light existed was through illuminated fog and mist, hovering, perfectly still, a few feet above the forest floor, never moving and obscuring any view ahead of us as we left the compass guide us towards the meadow in the center of the Red Forest, where the notorious, dilapidated cabin had occupied a considerable amount of our recent recollections. We just knew that we had as good a chance as anywhere else at finding Andre. Through streams and mud, peering through fog, two hibernated lichens moved through the dense bush and open forest, senses alert and hopeful of some sight of Andre. The odors moved through the breeze and were getting stronger. We were clearly not alone. Victoria and I remained vigilant and certainly tense. We were anxious to find Andre, and only Andre, and make our way back home and finish the unreliable ritual. As we felt we were getting closer to our paddock, we heard screams. They were male screams, and staggered us to our knees and behind some wild shrubbery, listening. The screams were in Russian. <laughs> And Victoria listened intently, while I remained focused on the fear and the timber of the shouts, rather than the words that I couldn't decipher. Victoria looked at me and said, It's Andre. He is screaming to us. I was dazed. Us? I asked her what the hell she was talking about. She said that he was warning us, that it's a trap, and to run... He must have known we would come, and then continued to scream louder amidst yelps of agony intermittently. We crept closer, fixing on the direction of the sound. I had no idea how we could help him. We were concerned about being watched at that point and being ambushed. We were cripplingly alert. We crept until we saw the lit up pasture, and figures in the distance came into view. The screams continued. We couldn't turn tail and run not leaving Andre to the torment of whoever it was holding him. But to be honest, we knew who it was. My worry was not them. My fear were the other things existing in the forest. The things that were of both worlds. Those Chudo-lichen beasts. Where Chudos? 
They were terrifying and would have heard this racket also. It was dusk and whatever decision we made would have to be soon. Andre, as far as I know, was my only hope. He was also my friend. We peeked out to see that it was indeed who we thought it would be. It was Maxim, Boris, and Anastasia. Surprisingly, we came up behind them, still concealed behind the forest line, staying low. Their backs were to us. Andre was on his knees, hands tied, purposely ungagged. He had a large knife to his throat. My heart was beating wildly. I don't know what we could do. One step forward and we would all be dead, including Andre. I wasn't sure what I was now most concerned with. Retrieving Andre for his blood? Or now saving him? We agreed between us that we would remain quiet and watch for now. Perhaps there would be a moment. An opportunity that we could seize, but nothing seemed realistic at the moment. Maxim, Boris, and Anastasia continued to peer around while Andre, head lowered, sobbed. It was clear that he had been cut up and beaten. Even with Andre on his knees from our rear view, it was apparent that blood was soaking his shirt. We remained out of sight. We could smell them and we know they could smell us. But they weren't aware of our location, seemingly. I knew that we had minutes before darkness fell. The last of the sun was immersed in the grayness of dusk. The sobs of Andre were more muted now. Stop it. Let me go. Noticeably fatigued, he sounded. A threatening sensation saturated the breeze, the fog, and the drifting trail of a scent in the air. We sensed this only once before. The group ahead were visibly uneasy. The forest became quieter. Then, the distant sound of heavy breathing and low, deep moans from numerous directions. Slow thumping into the mud and dead leaves, audibly, moving closer. Andre knew what this was and let out a howl, which prompted the beings out of view to also howl. Anastasia, Boris, and Maxim were startled and on guard. They pulled away from Andre, who remained bound and began to run. Andre dropped to the ground. We sprinted to him when we knew the area was clear of the pack, but needed to move fast, as these were not Chudos. These were, most definitely, the hybrid monstrosities that killed Peter in front of us. Giant beasts, powerful and too much for us to manage. Victoria was lucky once, when inflamed with vengeance upon the destruction of Peter and with a surprise attack, but we would need to move quickly. Andre still groaning from the pain. <sighs> Andre, please shut up, please stay quiet, and we can get you out of here. Can you walk? I could see that his chest was slashed and was bleeding heavily. His legs had been cut up, which made it nearly impossible for him to walk. He was lucid, but crippled. We dragged him, but he was too heavy. I kept trying to get him onto my back, but he kept sliding off due to the blood. I had no idea until that moment that blood was so slippery. Then we saw them at the tree line. My God, there were so many. Far more than the sounds of their approach had given away. At least 15 of them stood before us. The tallest must have been nine feet tall. Massive long arms. Faces showing the bizarre mutations of their radioactive half. The teeth and fur showing the results of their curse. The witches Baba Yaga would have felt ashamed that they had only half created the nightmarish aberrations that stood before us. We would be lucky to escape ourselves but there was no chance that we were getting Andre out of here. He couldn't crawl, let alone walk. I looked down at him, while the giant, hairy figures seemed to give us a moment. He slowly raised his eyes up to meet mine. He was afraid, but more sad, it seemed. I cried and begged him to find the strength to run. He found the strength to utter the words, 
Your sin conchil, my drug. I am finished, my friend. Victoria translated for me. Then, in English, she said, uh, Run! Run! Uh, but first, take what you need, Alex. You know, you, you must have my blood. The light was nearly complete, but I could see the last glare of the dying sun reflecting across his bloodshot and teary eyes. Victoria walked between me and Andre and the unwelcome guests with glowing eyes in the freshly darkened woods. She stood firmly, growling at them. She began to change. We knew, and she knew, that she was buying us time. I looked at Andre with tears in my eyes, my mouth filled with daggers, and my form changed also. And when I was fully in lichen mode, I closed my eyes with some small semblance of emotion, a wisp of memory for my friend. And I ripped into his neck, lapping up as much blood as I could. I was dizzy from it, staggering until the shrieks of the mutated masses ahead of us woke me from my euphoria. I dropped Andre to the ground, my mouth covered in his blood. Victoria turned to look at me and grunted fiercely in her lupine form which I knew, without mistake, that she was ordering me to start running. So I turned and sprinted as fast as my muscular woven legs could carry. I turned briefly to see that Victoria had stayed behind. I howled to her. I was more and more in tune with myself but in the body of this beast. I could no longer see her but heard the frenzied screeching and tearing of flesh and prayed it was not her. But I knew it would be. She was slowing them for me. I wouldn't let her die in vain. I continued running through the forest, and when I got out of the forest, it was completely black. But my eyes, in this body, permitted me some night vision. However, this vision was darker and less clearer than normal. Was Andre's blood having an effect on me? Bad fucking timing, if you ask me. I started changing back, and as I did, I fell to the road outside, just before the car. Limbs and ghastly overtures of shapes and stretching, bones cracking, as I resumed my old form. I heard the things pursuing me, and very close. I ran to the car. Luckily, the keys were where we had left them above the visor. Newly naked, I wouldn't want to think where I could have kept them. I turned the engine as I saw them approaching quickly from the rearview mirror. I hit the gas, and I tore out of there with at least four or five in tow, keeping up with my speed until I finally accelerated enough to lose them. I didn't stop until I reached Victoria's house, and this time, without her, and without Andre. Everyone I knew was now dead, but I was alive. I placed myself in the cage, although I should have remained lichen, but had changed back to my human form shortly after Andre's blood infusion. I was stunned into silence from the loss, so much loss that night. I did find solace in the fact that I had been cured. It had worked, just as Victoria had explained it. It was time to leave. I slept without incident. I awoke and got a shower. I got dressed and I packed up everything that I owned. I left Victoria and Peter's home locked their door for what it was worth. I drove to Pripyat and took all that I had from my local bank savings account. I drove the car to the airport in Kiev. I booked a flight to London via Prague and then would book the final flight home to Toronto. I boarded my flight and I slumped into the seat. I could still taste Andre's blood. Andre's magical blood that saved me from a cursed life of living as a slowly decaying aberration that existed only to destroy and take lives in the worst way possible. I would tell nobody of this, I thought. As I peered around the packed flight, Andre, Peter, Victoria, each saved my life in different ways. I would never forget them. I placed the sleep mask over my eyes as they shut out the cabin lights and I began to dream of my friends back home, my family, and the ponds in which we played hockey in the wintertime. 
the hamburgers and hot dogs that I would devour when I got home, despite temporarily thinking that I might go vegan. I was fast asleep until a sharp spasm in my stomach woke me. I peeled off my sleep mask, and I remembered that I hadn't eaten since, well, a while. I was starving. I fought through the pain, and I called over a cabin crew for some peanuts or bread. When she arrived, she looked at me and dropped the tray she was carrying and squealed in a high-pitched shriek. I turned towards the window of the plane and my surrealistic image in the reflection of the blackened window showed a clear propagation of familiar hair on my face, punctuated by the contrasting starkness of a brightened eyes. As I put my hand to my mouth in anticipation of my own scream, I saw that my hands had become elongated and my nails growing. My last shred of conscious thought during this was, bizarrely, why I had no longer felt the pain that accompanied this change. Then, on the cusp of a singular concern for what would happen next on this filled flight of now hysterical innocent passengers, old people, women, and children, suddenly my mind was no longer my own. It was farther gone than it had ever been. The plane's cabin was immersed in blood. Before it came down somewhere in Poland, somehow, I survived and disappeared from the wreckage into Jovsianska Rabina Forest. I wish I hadn't.